Good afternoon. My name is Adrian Dix. I'm BC's Minister of Health. To my right is Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer. This is our COVID-19 briefing for Friday, November the 27th. We're honored to be here on the territories of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Sangis, and the Esquimalt First Nations. Uh, we'll be back briefing on Monday, uh, November the 30th, here in Victoria, uh, providing all the information we usually do. And with that, uh, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. Uh, thank you very much, and good afternoon uh, for today. Um, for our update, we are reporting 911 newly diagnosed cases of uh, COVID-19 in the province, including four epidemiologically linked cases, bringing our total number of diagnosed cases in the province to 30,884. This is 153 people in Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 649 people in the Fraser Health Region, 27 people in the Vancouver Island Health Region, 47 people in the Interior Health Region, and 35 people in Northern Health. Um, we now have uh, 301 people in hospital across the province, 69 of whom are in critical care or ICU. And sadly, again today, we have 11 new deaths to report bringing the total number of people in our province who've died from COVID-19 to 395. And um, the vast majority of these people were people in their 70s and 80s, our seniors, our elders, grandparents, um, spouses, family members. And I know there are 11 additional families out there who are grieving today. And we send our condolences to them to their care providers and most of the cases today were also um, people who are living in long-term care and we know how challenging that has been this last year. We, uh, we now have uh, 10,430 people who are under public health monitoring and 21,304 who have recovered from COVID-19. We also have three new healthcare outbreaks at the German Canadian Benevolent Society Home, Villa Cathay, and Morgan Place Care Home. And one uh, outbreak has been declared over at the Peace Portal Senior Vis Seniors Village. That leaves us with 59 active outbreaks in our health care system, 54 in long term care and assisted living, and five in acute care, involving uh, 1,100. And 62 people, 718 residents, and 434 staff who are active cases at this time. I just wanted to remind everybody as we have these large numbers of people who are being diagnosed in our province and under active monitoring that as part of our contact tracing efforts, teams are working to identify if there's an outbreak or not. Public health teams may conduct or may ask and offer widespread testing of people, whether symptomatic or asymptomatic, in, in settings like workplaces, like schools, um, and uh, long-term care homes, even if um, there's not widespread community transmission in that area. And the priority is to contact those who are positive first to make sure that people are isolating. So there may be a delay in people getting um, results in some cases if they're negative in these outbreak investigations. I've received a, uh, quite a lot of, oh, I guess I am one more, I want to make one more comment about uh, some of our our data that we'll be reporting later today. The number of new cases, as we know, is one of those numbers that we all uh, look at very carefully every day and pay close attention to. But equally important for us is, of course, the percentage positive of those who have been tested for COVID-19. Until recently, we have taken a holistic approach in that we include all testing that was done of everybody in the province um, and report the percent positives of those. This includes 
includes what we call uh, testing under MSP funding, so people who have a billing number, and also non-MSP funding. And much of that is uh, people who are tested for other reasons. It may be federal populations, for example, uh, uh, penitentiary, uh, correctional officers, and other federal populations, including First Nations in BC. And as well, we know uh, many of these tests are for travel, for sport, or for um, in, uh, because they're required in industry. As our cases and our surge has increased here in BC, we've seen a difference in the percent positive between these two groups of, of uh, t these two testing groups. Under MSP, our testing approach, as you know, has been to test people with symptoms, and the percentage, of course, is higher, because in many cases we are case finding, particularly in a case of a cluster or an outbreak in a setting like long-term care or a workplace. Um, the non-MSP tests include mostly people who are asymptomatic, uh, although there are as well some related to investigations in clusters. And often there are people who are being tested multiple times for work or for, uh, for travel. As a result, over the last few weeks, the difference in, um, in the percent positive in those two groups has, has been uh, considerable. And now we're going to, uh, re with those uh, getting tested multiple times in the lower non-MSP risk group, um, the percentage is quite a bit lower. Our weekly BC situation report, which comes out on Friday afternoons, um, will now show both of these, the MSP, the total, and the non-MSP, so that everybody can see what we have been looking at um, on an on a local level and the differences between those two groups. And that uh, more accurately reflects some of the community transmission that we are seeing across the province. I've received a lot of questions, not surprisingly, in the last week about things like our indoor fitness uh, group activities and, of course, um, the issue about uh, gatherings and events and why some are included. Um, firstly, around the guidance for indoor group fitness activities, as you know, those activities, whether they're sport or, or fitness, are on hold right now. And it's the group participation that is the concern. So whether that's more than, than two or three people. Our, our teams have been looking at the evidence about this and looking at the situation around the world and to make sure we get things right so that when they restart, it can be done safely. And we hope that that guidance will be available. I had hoped it would be available sooner, but it has turned out to be more complex than we realized. And that uh, evidence review and the um, development of these new safe guidelines is ongoing and I'm hopeful by the end of next week we will have those posted and uh, more details will be available. I've also um, talking about the events and the mass gathering orders that we have. It's important to remember what, when we set quite a long time ago that 50 person limit for events and we were consistent throughout this period of time in using that it was the understanding that COVID safety plans would be in place, included um, in any event that was under 50. And the guidelines to develop the plans were based on what we were seeing and what we knew about this virus and about its transmission in the community and in indoor settings and other places. When we look at where transmission is occurring, we look at those things, and we've talked about this a few times. We know that some settings are more risky than others. So indoor settings, the types of activities can be more risky than others. So whether it's a wedding or an event where you're socializing with your group of people, or whether it's an indoor fitness class, and of course, the people who are at that event. We know, for example, that social gatherings are much riskier because it's hard for us to resist that, that need to be close to people that we know and care for. Right now, in BC, as around the world, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, across this country, in Europe, and other places, we are seeing a much higher level of community transmission. This means that things that were safe using the guidelines we had developed over the last 10 months are no longer in that safe zone. 
This is different than what we were experiencing before in the spring, in the summer, and even earlier in the fall. This means that any location that was able safely to have gatherings even a few weeks ago, including temples, churches, gudvaras, and other important critical religious venues, are not safe today. I'd like to be clear that these locations are not doing anything wrong. I know the vast majority have had very good COVID safety plans in place. They've had limited, uh, limited numbers of people coming for services. But despite that, we have seen outbreaks in BC, in churches, in multiple faiths, in multiple places in the province, in temples, in gurdwaras. So these are not decisions that we make lightly. We have seen transmission despite people's best efforts in settings and we know that we don't want to be passing this on to people who may be at high risk in those settings. I've spoken about the fact that we are in a pandemic storm, our COVID storm, and now we are facing a storm surge and that is something that we are facing globally. While we might have been safe to be close to the water, close to that edge, our safe zone has moved back. That sandbar where we can um, act safely has, not, uh, has become smaller. And that is why we put in these restrictions now on those social gatherings, on those places, those events that were safe even a few weeks ago. And we all need to do our part to bring that community transmission back down so we can resume those activities that are so important. It is a cruel irony in many ways that when we most need to be with people, that is the most dangerous thing that we can do with this level of transmission we're seeing in communities across the province. Uh, but we do remember that every storm ends and that the surges wane and our focus right now has to be on doing that. I'd also want to, to put out my appreciation and gratitude to the many faith leaders around this province who are um, supportive of this, who are paying attention, who are um, supporting their congregants at this time of need because it is a, a, a most uncertain and frustrating and challenging time. And now's the time more than ever we need each other and we need to be with each other safely. I know many people are looking forward to holidays ahead, the winter breaks and many um, celebrations that are coming and for some preparations are underway. And for many retailers I know out there, this is a, a very big time of year, whether you're a small or a large retailer. And this is another area where we have uncertainty right now. And this weekend, I know many people will be thinking about holiday shopping, about things that they want um, to have and give, especially on what they call Black Friday today. So my message to you and my ask of you is if you do plan on shopping, remember to keep your COVID safety plans in mind. And that means keeping your distance, wearing your mask, washing your hands, keeping the, 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 your numbers small, keeping local, and limit your travel. Shop locally. Um, support our local businesses who need our support, whether that's shopping online and picking up or booking ahead or going at a time where it's not so busy. Support the businesses in your community. Please also remember that we need to to stick with our immediate households right now. So no social gatherings. Do that remotely so that we're not passing this virus on to those that we care most about. And let's make this weekend a safe weekend for everybody. I know we are all feeling the strain, but I want to remind everybody of the importance when we're in these stressful and anxiety times of kindness and compassion of not taking it out on others, of remembering that we don't always know another person's story. We've heard stories this week and that make me very concerned and sad about store clerks and restaurant staff 
who have faced undeserved aggression from people who don't want to wear a mask. Please remember that this requirement to wear a mask in indoor public locations is a provincial order that everyone must follow, just as we do things like wearing seat belts and helmets and following the speed limits. This is something that you do to protect yourself and to protect others, and we need to remind ourselves that particularly when we're in indoor spaces, it is important for us to show the respect and protection for those who are working in those spaces too. It's a layer of protection for everybody and a courtesy to those around you. And if you are opposed to wearing a mask, then I ask you to shop online, order takeout, or stay outside, or stay home, and um, not put other people at risk. I remind all of us about the severity of this illness and the fact that we have people who are suffering in our hospitals right now, and their families are suffering too, and that these small, simple actions make a big difference for all of us. We are stronger when we work together, and this is not forever. It may be hard to see the light right now, but there is light, and we are planning, and we will work together, and we will get through that and in this, we also have to continue to remind each other that kindness makes a difference. And it is kindness to each other that will help us get through. And we do that as well, staying calm and staying safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. And uh, first of all, I want to start by uh, expressing my condolences for the uh, families of the 11 people, eight in Fraser Health and three in Vancouver Coastal Health, who passed away in the last 24 hours uh, from COVID-19. Um, we are thinking of you today, of the grief you must feel, and of the challenge of, that this virus presents for everyone, for family members, for friends, for caregivers, for communities especially those communities who are dealing with outbreaks in long-term care, where people are most vulnerable to this virus. And so uh, it's for them and in thinking of them that we're asking everybody today to, um, to think this weekend and to act this weekend in ways that will stop the transmission of COVID-19. I wanted to note, um, as Dr. Henry has noted, the 301 people uh, currently hospitalized with COVID-19, the 69 in critical care, uh, we have um, continued to have uh, adequate uh, capacity in our acute care sector, 71.5% occupancy if you count the base beds and the surge beds in acute care overall, 55.6% of capacity filled in critical care. But as everyone knows, the challenge is not just having the bed capacity but having adequate staff and resources to deal with the situation. We do for the moment, but it is important, I think, for everyone to understand how, how critical it is for everybody, for those waiting for other procedures and for everyone, that we do everything we can to stop the spread. Over the last uh, number of days as well, uh, I've had the occasion to meet with a number of religious leaders and communities uh, virtually uh, and to participate uh, yesterday in my own church in, uh, in uh, some uh, uh, religious study uh, yesterday virtually. And I just want to express my appreciation to, uh, to religious leaders, faith leaders around British Columbia for their leadership because I want you to know uh, how much of a sacrifice we know it is not to have in-person services this weekend, whatever day those services would take place on, whatever faith, that it's important. And generally speaking, those kind of activities, whether it be those activities or other cultural activities, are a way we measure health in our community. So we understand that. But it is necessary with the current state of the pandemic in British Columbia to follow the orders that Dr. Henry put in place eight days ago. And until December 7th, that means no in-person um, services, religious services. And uh, I, again, I want to say that I've had, I think, um, very positive discussions with leaders of faith around the province. 
uh, understanding ones. And I understand the sacrifice uh, that everyone is going to, but we need it now. And it's, it's that leadership, that leadership we've seen from throughout the province that will help us deal uh, in this most difficult of times with uh, the challenges that we have with the transmission of COVID-19. So I want to thank them. I want to, again, remind people of the need, especially this weekend, to take every step to stop the transmission of COVID-19. You know, this is the kind of time of year. Um, uh, Dr. Henry and I did our, I think, first briefing um, uh, after our first cases, uh, case of COVID-19 about 10 months ago, a little over 10 months ago. It's hard to believe it's been that long. And we know and I understand um, that uh, people would like a break. But right now, that's not possible. I understand that the month of December, where this is the last weekend of November, is important to many people. It's a year. It's uh, often a time of celebration and holiday, uh, of course, for children over the over the winter break and a celebration of uh, Christmas and Hanukkah and other uh, religious uh, celebrations that are of critical importance to people. But right now, this Christmas, we have to, I think, think of ways. Um, and the orders are in place on December 7th, and we'll have more to say about that next week. But think of ways that we can celebrate together, that we can make this Christmas of 2020, at the end of this year of 2020, this year of pandemic, and other things that have come to that our society and our country has had to face and our world has had to face, that we can have a special celebration that allows us with the people that we are, that we are in our household to celebrate a true spirit of the season, whether it's Christmas or other occasion, that, um, that will be memorable, I think, in a time when surely such celebrations will help us all. And to remember, that physical distancing saves lives. This weekend, it's important to remember that. That wearing a non-medical mask in, in indoor public spaces saves lives. And it's, a provincial, and it's a provincial order as well. That staying home when we're sick saves lives. That washing our hands saves lives. That coughing and sneezing into our sleeve saves lives. That avoiding non-essential travel saves lives. And for now, we save lives by socializing only with those in our household. And if we live alone with only the one or two people we've seen regularly all along. Uh, it's a time when we're starting to see in our communities Christmas lights on our houses, our balconies, and our storefronts in our neighborhood. And for a, the next little while, let these lights also serve to remind us that in stopping the spread of COVID-19, the work of each of us, every one of us, matters. Let them remind us, those lights remind us, that we're not alone in our efforts. Friends, neighbors, and people we've never met are doing the same work that we are doing. And in this, let's find seasonal joy and comfort in knowing that on our own, and by working together, we can make the most important difference this year, stopping the spread and saving lives of those we love and of those we don't know. Aujourd'hui, nous en ensemble, uh, um, des nouveaux cas de COVID-19 en Colombie-Britannique, 911. Nous sommes attristés d'annoncer 11 nouveaux décès liés au COVID-19 pour un total de 395 décès en Colombie-Britannique. Nous offrons nos condoléances à tous ceux qui ont perdu leurs proches durant cette pandémie. Parmi l'ensemble des cas confirmés de COVID-19, 301 personnes sont actuellement hospitalisées dans 69 en soins intensifs. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. We're happy to take your questions. Thank you, Minister. As a reminder to everybody on the phone, please press star one to enter the queue. You are limited to one question and one follow-up only. I would also ask that you please unmute your phones. You will not be audible until your name is called. First question today is from Sheila Scott, CTV. Hello? Go ahead. 
Oh, hi. This is actually Penny. I don't know why Sheila got on the list. That's why I was confused there. Uh, it's Penny from CTV for Dr. Henry. Um, I'm just looking at the uh, federal data on active cases right now. BC has not only um, surpassed the active cases for Quebec per capita, we now have more than double the active cases of Ontario per capita. So I'm just wondering, is it time to bring BC's approach more in line with what Ontario is doing? For example, a color-coded system for public health measures. Yeah, so um, we all have our own pandemic. And as we know, uh, the issues that we're dealing with are, are focused in some areas and are uh, different in different areas of the province. And so our approach has always been um, to look at what is happening here and tailor our approach to what is happening here. And uh, uh, many of our measures are ones that we put in place quite a long time ago that Ontario has included in some of their uh, different uh, color zones now. So it, it's, uh, it's not uh, like we can compare what we're doing. We're doing the things that we need to do to manage what we're dealing with here in BC. Penny, do you have a follow-up? I do. Um, it's been more than a week since you implement, impl implemented some of those new provincial restrictions, still breaking case uh, records. So I'm just wondering, are you considering further measures? What might be on the table and how soon could we hear of those possible measures? Uh, of course, we're looking at things very carefully and what we're looking at are, you know, sometimes increasing numbers is a reflection of, of case finding, of when we're finding clusters and outbreaks and being able to understand who's infected and uh, manage them and that is part of what is going on. There's also increased community spread, which is why we have some of the measures in place around group indoor fitness, why we have uh, suspended all events around the province right now. And those are the numbers that we're going to be watching very carefully. Uh, we've talked about this before. We look at rolling seven-day average. We look at uh, numbers, uh, the percent positive in cases in the local area and a, a broad area. We look at um, uh, numbers of, of unlinked cases in our community. And we're dealing with some very um, straining situations around the province in the north, um, in the interior, uh, as well as Fraser and Vancouver Health, um, and even here on uh, Vancouver Island. So, yes, absolutely, I am talking daily with my colleagues about what's going on, what the situation is, what are the things that we need to, to think about in terms of addressing them, and, you know, what uh, measures um, can we look at modifying or changing. So those are conversations that we will continue to have, and uh, we will be able to have a better idea next week. Um, we're still in the place where we um, are not surprised to see cases going up. Um, obviously, we want to see that corner bend. Next question is from Richard Zussman, Global News. <laughs> are you there, Richard? Richard, your line is open. Please check I'm if your here. phone is muted. It was. I'm using new headphones. I apologize. Uh, Dr. Henry, you mentioned in the answer there to Penny uh, that, you know, we're all dealing with our own pandemic. But, you know, clearly this is the same virus in every province. So why are we doing things differently in terms of, you know, masking policies in schools, uh, restrictions around you know, pulling kids out of schools, like what makes you believe that we are doing it better or differently than other provinces on, on both those issues in terms of managing the virus? Yeah, I, I actually um, think that we are aligned uh, with our colleagues across the country, certainly in uh, Quebec and Ontario, when I talk about uh, management of what's going on in schools. Um, we look to other countries around the world. The plans that we have in place are aligned with what others are doing as well, including you know, mask wearing in common areas and uh, uh, where they're required for adults in the school system, etc. So I don't think there's as many differences as there are commonalities. And every school, we know, has its own um, community, it has its own ventilation systems, its own way of, you know, numbers of children, age of children, so there is variation um, both across our province and across the country in how some things are done, for sure. Richard, do you have a follow-up? I do. I know 
masks aren't the be-all and end-all, but there's been a big change in that. In Ontario, they require mask wearing from grades four up until grade 12. That's a clear difference. And so I'd like to get your sense on that. But also, you know, what we're also seeing in other jurisdictions, we've seen stories recently uh, in Alberta and Ontario around uh, concerns of political interference when it comes to the pandemic. And I know what we've done here has been different, but have you ever felt any pressure politically to make any decisions, especially when it comes to, you know, industry, like the construction industry or the tourism industry, have you ever felt political interference? Yeah, I, I'm, in terms of masks in schools, I think if you look at the details of what the guidance that we've put out from a health perspective, it's all aligned. But uh, in terms of political interference, the, the short answer is no. Um, we have had many discussions about um, pros and cons, and I have been um, very seized with the importance of measuring unintended consequences of the actions that we've put in place. And we did things like the survey uh, that, uh, that actually will be going up uh, for people to look at some of that information themselves, and we're looking at how we can repeat that to get a better sense of what's ha happening more recently. Um, but we've also been uh, spending a lot of time understanding the impacts of school closures. And we've seen some um, data coming out from other countries. We've had a report ourselves that's up on the BCCDC website. And that is why we are so focused on the things that we need to do to protect schools, keep schools safe, and keep schools open. Because we know the downside impacts of not, not having in-classroom learning for children affects them for the rest of their lives some more than others. And that is an important differential, important inequity that we need to address. So these are all things that I have been working on with uh, our team um, here in BC, and we have a number of different areas that we've been looking at. So we do factor those in and balance those um, issues. We know that poverty leads to a long-term health effects for families. So it is important absolutely for us to be aware of those issues and I have had uh, many occasions where we've had discussions about uh, the pros and cons of different, um, different measures we can take. Um, but our focus has always been on health and I um, have the benefit of having an independent position so I can issue orders independently as we know um, during the, the election period for example and I've not felt in political interference in any way to change the decisions of, of us, uh, my team around public health issues. Alana Shepard, Glacier Media. Hey there Dr. Henry, thank you so much for taking my call. I wanted to ask you about the restrictions regarding team sports. I know you stated that there are important, they're an important, important part of communities, sorry, but you've also shared examples of how just one COVID positive person can have a detrimental impact on a community. And so we know that Christmas and holiday events are also important to people and many of them are physically distanced and outdoors. And so I guess my question is why are you making the exception for sports, particularly for allowing individuals to travel outside of their respective home health authorities? Yeah, so there's two different things we're talking about here. We're talking about events, and we've asked for suspension of events, whether they're indoor or outdoor, um, even if it's uh, a special holiday event. And I know those are important, but we've asked to suspend those for this period of time, and we need to focus on, on the things that are most important around work and school and health. And we know that physical fitness is an important part of that. And so particularly children's outdoor sports, what we have said is we've looked at where they, the issues are around transmission, and they mostly are on the sidelines, the before, the after. So that's why we've made some restrictions around um, team travel, around um, no spectators, and uh, to try and at least give opportunities for, for people to have some uh, activity, physical activity in a structured way in their lives because we know that's important. Um, and in terms of travel, we're, we're, it's not by health authority, it's by community. We want people to stay in their community. We're not letting teams play in different communities because we know that means then they might have to carpool. But we know that individuals, particularly in the lower mainland, you may live in, in uh, one area and work in another area. You may go to school in, in a community that's uh, adjacent to where you live. So it doesn't make sense to not allow somebody to 
play in a team in a, a community that might be uh, across the street but in a different health authority. So we're trying to, uh, we've been working with Via Sport and with communities to say pull it back, you know, make sure that you're not um, doing a lot of travel and if you do have to travel go just with your um, your family to your games, make sure you do the physical distancing. Right now in particular, you know, keeping those distances, making sure that if we are doing team sports that we do it in a way that minimizes contact because we know that there's still transmission happening in our communities. But it is important for people to get out and not just the team sports. I won't, you know, everybody should get outside and go for a walk. Take your family, take the dog, go for a walk 15 minutes a day, get outside. It's important for all of us. Do you have a follow up? Yeah, so under the new mandatory mask rule um, in public indoor spaces, I wanted to know how this is applied to kitchens and restaurants because that was sort of a big issue before. Um, kitchen staff did not have to don masks uh, when they were working in the back, and so I'm just wondering if they're required to now under the new order. Yeah, so this um, refers to indoor public spaces, and we know that uh, restaurants have work safe plans as well. So worker safety comes under the workplace plans and uh, WorkSafe BC is um, doing a blitz around uh, restaurants and others, uh, workplaces. They've done quite a lot of work on that and we've stepped up the, the mask requirements for workplaces. So this is important for all workplaces, whether it's an office building, whether you work in a kitchen in the restaurant, uh, whether you work in a retail place. Where we see transmission happening is often between staff, staff to staff. And we see it in the healthcare setting too. We work with people every day and we forget that we bring that risk that we have in our home, in our community, with us to our workplace too. So now it is incredibly important, I've said this several times, for us to review the COVID safety plans for workers in every work setting and make sure that we're not sitting next to each other at lunch times, that we're not in those small break rooms together and taking our masks off and spending time together. We have to keep our distance right now. And for many places that also means uh, um, doing remote meetings and remote uh, connections with people rather than everybody coming into the office. So it, it's all part of that. In restaurants, absolutely. If the person is not part of your household, then you, if you're in that close space with them, you should be wearing a mask. Next question is from Ashley Wadwani, Black Press. Hi, this is a question um, I think for uh, Dr. Bonnie Henry, but maybe possibly Adrian Dix has something to say. Um, you and other health officials um, in health authorities have said for a few weeks that contact tracers are becoming stretched to their limits <clears throat> as, uh, as case numbers rise. And one of the things that we've heard uh, as being one of the reasons making things difficult for contact tracers is the uh, stigma around being uh, infected with COVID-19. Uh, can you maybe speak to what that stigma looks like in BC right now, how big of a problem it is in your eyes, um, and perhaps how this stigma can be addressed um, if it is stopping people from getting tested when they should be? Yeah, so this is unfortunately something that we've seen with with every infectious disease that, that comes around, um, especially when we see it being labeled with a certain um, group for example, as we did early on with this virus, I, I do believe as well that people are coming to recognize that this is transmitted through people and that um, it's not something people intend to do. It's not because of certain practices. It's because we are social creatures and we are around each other. And when we let our guard down, this virus can transmit very easily. Where we have seen people being stigmatized, um, being teased, particularly in schools, unfortunately. We've seen it in some workplaces. We've seen it in some communities when people are being open about um, the fact that they uh, they have infected, been infected with uh, COVID-19 and are sick with COVID-19. So uh, we have to realize now more than ever that this virus is spreading very rapidly in communities around our province, around our country, around the world. And it's not, a, it does not recognize any race or any color or any sex or any of the, the issues that we see um, when we look at people. This virus doesn't discriminate, but systems do. 
and we do. And right now, we have to take a step back and recognize that we need to protect ourselves and keep each other safe by accepting that people are going to be infected and supporting them, supporting them to, to contact people who they may have been close to, supporting them in, in staying home and staying well, supporting them if you have been a close contact of somebody else to isolate through the incubation period. That is really important. And yes, our contact tracers are hearing some of the stories and it's sad. It's harmful and it's hurtful. And we need to, to, to remember that we're not immune to this. And we all have to um, support each other. And if you are somebody who's a close contact, then there's, um, there's places you can go. You can call 811 you can, uh, to get advice on what to do. If you need to be tested, we know how to get you tested. And it can be done safely and quickly. And, uh, and then you can um, be supported in, in isolating if you need to. But, you know, it's a very good point. Um, people are afraid to tell people that they have COVID and that they might be at risk. And that's where public health comes in, because we can do that and support you in doing that. But if you have been identified as a contact or you have um, tested positive, even before public health calls you, make a list. Um, think about the people, that the places you've been, the people you've been in contact with, and that can help us. Because yes, as the numbers are going up, it's becoming more and more challenging. And I know sometimes you, people don't get that fulsome phone call from public health for, for 24 to 48 hours. They just get the basic information of what they need to do, and that can be very anxiety provoking. So we do have tools to support people. I think the, the key point to remember is that um, being calm and being kind and being safe is not just uh, um, a very positive way of looking at it in an engaging way and I think consistent with our values, but it's also an effective approach. We absolutely need as a community um, to engage with people who uh, test positive for COVID-19. We need their close contacts to engage as well. That is the most effective way uh, to fight transmission of COVID-19. It's why, in addition to the more than 500 people who are working on contact tracing in the spring and summer, we've added first 500 and now more than 900 people doing contact tracing, plus those that are going to be hired in the First Nations Health Authority, plus those assistance we're getting from Statistics Canada. But we need to encourage everybody. And it's why sometimes people say, well, why aren't you taking what they would describe as a more punitive approach? We need the cooperation of people who are testing positive to work with us. That's what's the most effective way. That's how we better deal with COVID-19 in British Columbia. Being kind is not just the way we should all be in our lives, but it's the most effective way of dealing with COVID-19, of supporting public health and its contact tracing and supporting one another in very difficult times. And I, I just encourage everyone to remember that there are in this world hundreds of thousands of people who died from COVID-19, who have died from COVID-19 in the world. We have the cases that we have in British Columbia, the cases we have in Canada, thousands across the country. And we have done better in that measure than most other jurisdictions in the country, but the losses here have been tremendous. And I think the key to success, the key to continuing success is to contribute, to follow the guidance and the orders of Dr. Henry and to support one another in difficult times. And not just because that's the right thing to do, and it is, but because it's in every single person's interest to do so. Ashley, do you have a follow-up? I do, yeah. Um, so today has statistically broken some uh, kind of grim records or near them, such as high hospitalizations, for example. Um, this week is you know, rounding out our deadliest week since the pandemic began. I'm just wondering, um, are we simply seeing these increases because uh, con like social contact is higher and thus transmission is higher, uh, as our communities are obviously more open compared to restrictions during the height of the first wave? Um, or is this perhaps linked to the virus mutating or changing other factors? Um, hoping you can kind of speak to, to that a bit. Yeah.
between people. We see that with influenza. For some reason, influenza disappears in our summer and reappears usually around this time of year. We see it with adenoviruses and enteroviruses, all of those things that cause coughs and colds. And we've seen it with other coronaviruses that cause much milder illnesses. So there is a seasonality to this virus that we're just learning. And that means that as uh, as we move into winter, not only are we indoors more and having more contact with, with people indoors, but also the virus is spread much more easily. So it is a combination of things. And we were, uh, as we know, we've seen it uh, around the world, that's, that we seem to be holding our own. And then it was almost like a switch where we start to get rapid increase in cases. And part of that is, is a critical mass of infected people in the community. Um, and part of that is this season seasonality that we're starting to see. And, uh, we, you know, it's the same in Europe, it's the same in um, uh, across Canada, the United States. So that is a part of it. Um, we're learning about this virus all the time. We learned again um, over the past 10 months that there are situations that make it much more likely that the virus will spread. And where we had in those situations are basically indoors with poor ventilations in crowds, um, when we're talking loudly um, in confined spaces. So in closed spaces. And when we, the things that we did in the summer when there was less transmission in the community and the virus wasn't as able to spread, right now we can't do those anymore. So those guidelines that we had, those COVID safety plans that, that worked fine up until a few weeks ago, um, we now need to step back and say there's some things that are just too risky given this climate that we're in right now and, and the whole uh, state of the pandemic that we're in right now. So that's why we've had to put in additional orders, why we've stopped these events to try and take a step back, see if we can't reduce that transmission enough, uh, low enough, so that we can resume some of our group activities. But again, with additional safety measures in place through this time of, of the winter season. So it is a combination of learning about the virus, uh, learning about the situations that are more likely to lead to transmission, and having, um, having a rapid increase in numbers of cases, and therefore risk in the community. Marcella Bernardo, News 1130. Dr. Henry and Minister Dix, uh, thanks again for taking my question. I, I heard you speak earlier about changes in how data is shared. And one of the discrepancies that seems to be coming up uh, commonly is that the number of tests that we see on the dashboard here in British Columbia is different than what is sent to the federal government or to Ottawa. And so if you could explain if that's because of the testing that's done in the film industry, because there is some concern out there that the numbers aren't being as transparent as they should be when it comes to positivity rates being higher than they should be. Yeah, so it, it is what I just talked about today. Um, it is something that we follow and it was, it's a relatively new thing. So yes, what we report to, uh, uh, to the public health agency is consistent across the country. So it is the, the MSP, we call it, or publicly funded testing. So we have um, started to uh, report both of those and you'll see that in the surveillance report that comes out tonight. Um, that we have the MSP and the non-MSP. So we have been looking at those, and it's not just the film industry, that's one part of it, uh, that's a large part of it. Um, and so people who are repeatedly tested over time, usually low risk, although we're also seeing an increase in, in the non-MSP uh, rates as well as community rates go up, which is not surprising. But there's also other federal populations that are included in that. Um, so yes, for consistency across the country, the public health agency reports only uh, publicly funded testing. Do you have a follow-up, Martella? I do. I was hoping to see if, if you could explain, maybe in a ballpark way, I know it's difficult to, to pinpoint numbers, but considering that we now have a quarter of all schools in British Columbia that have recorded some kind of exposure of COVID-19, can you tell us how many school-aged children are now isolating at home or how many people linked to schools or isolating at homes among the more than 10,000 that you listed today? Uh, yeah, no, I can't. Uh, I can tell you it's a relatively small proportion overall, um, but I don't have... Uh, I don't have that off the top of my head. Um, you know, so the exposure events are not necessarily uh, linked 
to people needing to self-isolate. That depends on how long, uh, what activities people were doing, uh, how long, um, how many days they were in, how many people, with the age of people who they were um, next to. So those are all. Um, <laughs> challenging things and they're individual investigations of each, each case and as you know in the Fraser Health region we've been behind on some of those but we have not seen a lot of transmission particularly child to child transmission we've seen um, you know some adult to adult transmission in the school settings um, and we've seen some cases uh, a couple of outbreaks and a couple of cases where uh, children uh, classes or cohorts have had to be uh, sent home to uh, to self-isolate. There has been as well a number of schools that have closed because uh, of staff um, being uh, required to self-isolate. The children have been at home in those cases but not, um, not in isolation. So it is a relatively small percentage um, given, uh, you know, given the number of children and, and adults in our school system. We have time for one more question this afternoon. For everyone listening, Dr. Henry and Minister Dix will release a statement this afternoon with the latest information on cases, hospitalizations, and outbreaks, which you can find at news.gov.bc.ca. For in updated information about the province's regional restrictions, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash regional restrictions. And for information about the province's new orders and pandemic supports, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. Last question today is from Ethan Sawyer, CBC. Hi there. Um, hey there, social Ethan. gatherings. Can, can you start again? Hi there. Can you hear me? Yeah, start uh, again, please. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, Dr. Henry, uh, you've said that you're now seeing clusters in workplaces as opposed to social gatherings. Um, just wondering if you can specify what kinds of workplaces. Um, also earlier, you recommended that COVID safety plans be reviewed in workplaces, but do you think existing plans are sufficient or uh, do we need to see more restrictions? Yeah, so we've been working with WorkSafe um, to, with the new information that we just talked about, about transmissibility and situations where we're seeing um, people transmit the virus, whether it's, you know, lunchrooms, common areas, uh, carpooling to work together, uh, socializing before and after work or during um, lunch, for example. So we've stepped those up. We've also uh, stepped up the language about the importance of all of the layers of protection. And we have the, what we call the hierarchy of controls. So things like having barriers in place, but also if I'm um, a barista and I'm working behind a barrier to the public and I have other people working with me, then um, the importance of, of wearing masks in those situations. So we have been working with WorkSafe and uh, the um, business community around those issues. We have seen uh, clusters of cases in workplaces that range from uh, car dealerships, construction sites, uh, lumber mills or lumber places, um, a lot of light industrial places where people um, may be in close uh, contact with each other. We've had another poultry plant uh, where things had slipped and there was clusters, uh, quite a large number of people who were infected. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, there's a, quite a lot of places that um, you wouldn't expect and it it has been a spill-on effect from uh, from many of the social gatherings where there was transmission and then somebody went into work or th there was a transmission event at uh, you know we've seen some of the ones that I presented a spin class for example that uh, somebody w was at that class and went into work and uh, then spread it between people in the workplace where we have not seen, and, and this is imp um, important, is when we have those plans where uh, the worker and public interface, for the most part, uh, we're not seeing transmission there. So people can feel safe going into a retail store or um, uh, an office to get services. And we, we've not seen um, worker to public transmission very frequently. But yes, it is. We, as I was mentioning, we, we sometimes forget that we need to take precautions with those who are outside our household in our work environment as well. Do you have a follow-up, Ethan? I do. Um, so we've seen a lot of conversations about vaccines this week across the country. Uh, how concerned are you that Canada may get its supply of vaccine months after other countries get theirs? Um, and who in BC will determine order of priority to receive COVID-19 vaccines when they are available here? 
Um, also wondering if we can get this answer in French as well. Sure. Um, you know, I'm confident that Canada has um, has contracts in place, and there's many moving parts, as my friend said uh, yesterday from uh, Health Canada, Dr. Sharma. Um, so we know that in vaccine production, there are many things that can happen, um, but we are in the top of the list of countries around the world to receive vaccine. So as long as as vaccine is produced in the way that we expect it to be, but we have to remember that we also license our own products in Canada and Health Canada has been working with the, the manufacturers, particularly Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca and a number of others to do an ongoing review of the data as it's presented and uh, I'm, I, you know, the, the, the importance of safety of these vaccines is, is just paramount and I know we have a very robust system here in Canada for, for ensuring that safety and every lot has to be approved. So there are delays that can happen at many different levels and we see this every year with our immunization programs and you know public health runs immunization programs across this country the most recent one of course is our, our influenza immunization program so we know that there are places where things may get backed up or delayed and we also of course have to be aware that some countries may um, may put in restrictions and on product being leaving the country. We're hopeful that's not going to happen and the manufacturers are hopeful as well. So I believe we will see vaccine early in 2021 as predicted um, as soon as, as all the safety criteria are met. And here in BC we have a, a a BC Immunization Committee. We follow the National Advisory Committee on Immunization um, guidance and we are working very closely with uh, our BC Immunization Committee which includes public health, uh, clinicians, ethicists. Um, so we will be making recommendations about the priority populations in in BC given where we are in our state of the pandemic but they will align with the agreed upon principles and with the agreed upon um, uh, priority groups that the National Advisory Committee has uh, has put out in Canada and I am meeting with my colleagues across the country on a regular basis to discuss this very issue to make sure that across the country we are aligned. So the ultimate decision uh, will be uh, I guess you could say with me, but it will be advice that we take from uh, uh, from uh, my colleagues across the country as well as public health and of course it will be in consultation with uh, the Minister and the Premier. And uh, first in French I just want to remind people because I think the evidence uh, so shows this is the absolute need to be careful in common areas of workplaces and lunchrooms. That that is critically important. It's a critically important part of transmission, and it's a place where people absolutely have to follow COVID safety guidelines. When, uh, sadly, in that brief period, maybe when one's taking time off work, is the time when one has to take uh, ensure uh, safety in those circumstances. So, la question des vaccins, je dirais que. Uh, nous avons uh, uh, beaucoup de confiance dans l'effort du gouvernement fédéral uh, dans notre domaine. Je pense que c'est toujours difficile quand un uh, produit fabriqué en dehors du Canada d'assurer absolument l'arrivée au Canada uh, de ce produit, surtout un produit aussi essentiel que les vaccins. Mais cela étant, uh, le gouvernement uh, fédéral a des contrats. Uh, on a beaucoup de confiance dans leurs efforts. Il faut uh, tout de même uh, continuer à développer notre propre capacité au Canada de fabriquer et de produire uh, ces vaccins. Donc, ça, c'est important um, au, uh, au moyen terme. Mais actuellement, uh, nous avons beaucoup de confiance. Et notre devoir, c'est d'être uh, sûr, ici en Colombie-Britannique, qu'on est prêt. Et j'ai beaucoup de confiance uh, au Dr. Ross Brown, au Dr. Bonnie Henry, au Stephen Brown, toute notre équipe, pour assurer que ça va se dérouler d'une manière, uh, manière propre et efficace. Et c'est important parce que c'est uh, un processus de vaccination, uh, immunisation, le plus important dans l'histoire uh, 
de la province et euh, chaque euh, effort est important, mais ceci est le plus important et ça va euh, se, se dérouler d'une manière euh, euh, transparente. Uh, efficace et propre et j'espère uh, et j'ai beaucoup confiance et je vais je vais soutenir les recommandations de la santé publique uh, dans ce domaine par, et, et de d'assurer que les ressources ressources sont en place pour uh, pour une, un processus uh, réussi merci beaucoup thank you very much uh, I'll see you on Monday thank you